original variables from private to protected. Today we'll learn about another way to circumvent circumvent this problem. Just to call the constructor of the, of the shape class. So the idea is the properties that belong to the shape class should only be touched by the shape class. And it's not a good idea to, to change the scope of these variables so that you can have access in the base in the drive classes just so that you can change their values once and never touch them again. So the way that we do it is like this. This is still the same check class, but the constructor is set two values. Um, in, in the circle class, we call the constructor here. So this is where you put your initializer list, um, and you can also put the constructor of the, of the original class as well. So in here, you provide the, the values that, that you provide to circle will be sort of reround to shape and, and they will be set by the shape constructor. Circle doesn't do anything there except um, calling the constructor. But this is a much nicer way to um, encapsulate your data. Um, basically you separate your concern. The shape deals with um, the point of origin which, which is represented by mx and my and the circle only cares about the radius. Anything that deals with um, the, the point of origin should be dealt with in the shape class, not in the circle class. All right. So let's do some small exercise. Now, if you are not using a, 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 an IDE, then I highly recommend using an IDE. That's the anchor thing. This is my favorite IDE. Um, it's called C line. And um, if you use your email, your messy email, um, to register your account on just JetBrain website, you can have access to this for free. Otherwise, um, it will cost you like hundred dollars a year. So this is the original code that we looked at yesterday. We have a shape class. Um, it has a constructor that will set two variables. Now we have a circle class that inherits from shape, and it attempts to set these two variables in this constructor. But this is not allowed. Right? You can't even compile this. And a, a decent IDE will tell you that this is wrong. So if you try to compile it, it will say MX is a private member of shape if you don't have permission. Right. So if we change this from private to protected or public, it will compile. Nothing, nothing um, strange happens. But we don't want to do that. Right. We want to separate the concern of these variables from the derived classes. So instead of doing this, we will call the constructor in the initializer list. And you do that by putting a colon before the curly bracket and call shape and x, y. Right, so this will, will work. If you compile, it will compile. And it, print out, it will print out a correct, uh, not really, but it will print out something. All right, so that's um, constructor and how to invoke a constructor from the drive class. How to invoke a constructor of a base class in a derived class. It is here. Now you don't have to do it here. Um, you, you can, you can, you, you, don't, you don't have to use the initializer list, you can put it in here as well. But then you have to do things like shape, Okay. Next more, I think I should do. 
Um, yeah. This should work as well. Nope, it doesn't work. Forget what I just said. And uh, in case you have a multi-level relationship between classes, uh, let's say you have class A is the base class of class B, and the class B is the base class of class C, and the constructor of C should only call the constructor of B, shouldn't call the constructor of A, even though it is possible. Um, but it shouldn't. And the reason is when you call, we will come to it later, but when we call the constructor of a prior class, is a constructor of the base class. When we call the constructor of the derived class, it will call the constructor of the, um, the base class as well. So when you have something in between, let's say um, C inherits from B and D inherits from C, when you call D without doing anything, C constructor will be called and then D will be called. So if you want to affect the behavior of calling from the constructor, you should do it on the end. Um, at one level up. So this will some will call some constructor of the book. If you do it again here, then um, then this might be called twice and there will be unintended um, sick consequence of that. order in which the constructors and destructors are called. Oh, why is my destructor section the same as? So let's talk about constructor first. As I say, if you have a class A that is a base class of class B and a class C being a derived class of class B, then when you call C, this will happen. When you call C, it will call A first. And then it will call B. And then it will do whatever you have inside this concern. Um, so, right, the order uh, to call Constructor is a, is a special function in a class. There's another fu a special function um, which is a destructor. And the destructor is called when an object is out of scope or if you create it, um, if you allocate its memory dynamically and you call and, and you use the keyword delete, then when uh, let's say A goes out of scope. then a special function called destructor A will be called. And if you have a normal class with no memory allocation, then this is basically is doing nothing. But if you allocate memory within a class, let's say you have um, an array right, of int, in the constructor, the constructor will allocate some memory to this array. Um, if you don't sort of reclaim this memory, when the object is out of scope, then the memory that you occupy will stay there forever until until the program finishes. So in order to avoid that, you need to reclaim the memory in the in the destructor. Or to reclaim memory if if necessary. And the order in which this one is called is the opposite. So 
when you call the D sub term A, A, a class B derives from A, a class C derives from B. So when A is constructed, it will print down A created. When it is destructed, it will call it will print down A destroyed. And so, and the same to B and C. Right? And here I, I only initialize C. Let's see what happens. Yeah. So the order is from top to bottom. Even though I only initialize C, A and B. Uh, get full as well. And the order in which they are destroyed is the opposite. Right? So when you call the destructor of C, the first thing that will be called is obviously itself. And then the destructor of the immediate base class, which is B. And B is also a derived class of A, so B will call A. A is, no, is, is a derived class of no other class, so it will stop it. Let's go back to this um, example. <coughs> so in here, in the, in the shape class, I have a print function. Right? And circle inherits this print function automatically. That's why I can call C to print down here. And, and then this function will, will do this. It will print out mx and my. But because it is a circle, I want it to print out the radius as well. So what do I have to do to override it? Right. Call it print. Same name, same parameters, but um, different behavior. So um, obviously I can do this. If this was protected, then I can do it, right? But it is not. So. What I can do is to invoke this function from, from the base class. First I will call shape, like that. So it will print out the first two number. And then I will print out my own uh, radius. This is the behavior of the shape, right? It will print down in mx and my. Uh, and this is the behavior of the circle. It will first call the print function of the base class to print out mx and my because it doesn't have access to these directly. And then it will print out what it has x. And it will print a radius. So this is all fine and dandy, except that um, when you have a base class and a derived class, you can actually treat the derived class as a base class. And that is the meaning of polymorphism. Polymorphism is, poly is many, and morph, morph is form. So when you have, um, when you have a dog, you can treat it as a mammal, right? So any disease that affects mammals can be can, can affect dogs as well. And when you, you treat a dog for diseases that are related to um, any mammals, then you treat it as a mammal. So in general, if you have a derived class, you, you can construct a derived object. But you can treat it as a base of 
object. So this object, we have one object, but we can consider, sometimes we consider it a derived class, sometimes we consider it as a base class. It has two forms. So that's the meaning of polymorphism. Um, and the way that we do it is to declare this object to be of type shape. So instead of this, I can declare shape and C. But obviously, if it is, it is a shape, I can call a constructor with three arguments. Right? This is a constructor of uh, the circle. So I have to do it sort of indirectly by calling it as a, by allocating its memory dynamically. So when we do this, it's just coming down. When we do this, we construct a circle with these three arguments. So in a, in a memory, you will have a circle. But you assign the type of it, of the type of the variable to be shape. So when you do when you when you when you deal with C, let's say when you call C dot print, the, the compiler will consider C to be a shape instead of a Circle. Right, so let's see um, what happens. And one thing to remember is when it is a pointer, uh, you cannot use a dot notation, you have to use an arrow notation. Right. So let's recall previously when we call, when we have a real object uh, shape and a real object circle, um, object prints, uh, um, shape prints are 1, 2, circle prints are 1, 2, and 3. Right. Now we have a object circle, but we can we treat it as a shape. So the behavior is gone. The behavior of of the circle is gone. Now I only have the behavior of shape. Right. So that's um, obviously we, we do want to have the behavior of shape, um, and we can fix this problem by using something called dynamic binding. Binding is basically tie, tying the name of a, of a function to the address of the function in memory. When you have a C object, um, circle object, um, it has two functions print actually. It will have shape print, and it will have circle print. If you treat C not as a circle, but you treat it as a shape, right, the, 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 the compiler will sort of ignore it. It only sees this one as shape, so it finds a function called print in the scope of shape. And so yeah, here's what I find. So let's use this. Um, and this is all done static, uh, static, static linking. So the moment that you write that piece of code, it will say, because C is a shape, I will link it to this function at the compil compiling time. Um, but if we want to really invoke a function that belongs to the circle aspect of it, we have to say, hey, hang on. Even though you do find a print function in the, in the names, namespace of shape, and it is a shape, hang on. Don't call this function as, as, as now. Let's search for more. Right? So what is the real type of C? This is the pointer type. But the, the real type C is circle. Right, so hang on, don't call this one yet. Let's look at the real type. Right? It is a circle. Is there a function called print in the namespace of circle? Yes, there is. So instead of calling this, we call this. And this is called dynamic linking. It is called dynamic linking because it cannot be done at compiling times. And it, it, can, it can only be done at, at runtime because only at runtime you know what, real, um, what is the real type of an object. At compiler time, all it sees is this shape C, shape or circle. And the key word for saying, hey, hang on, don't, don't be don't rush. 
you see it's virtual. When you declare something virtual, basically you say, hang on a minute, don't, don't call me this yet. So let's come back to the code. We declare, so this function will, will be found first because the, 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 the pointer is shape, so it will first find anything in, in the shape name, namespace. If we want to say, hang on, don't, don't do anything yet, we have to say, use this keyword. Right. So this keyword will say, even though you find the spring function, let's find some more. Right. Now, if I have this, I get the behavior of the circle back. So this part is extremely important. Is there any problem, any question? Why would you go to trouble of um, defining it as, as a circle but then putting it as a, as a shape and, yeah. and then having trouble invoking the virtual function? Yeah, very good question. Very good. Because sometimes I have no choice. I have a shape. And shape can have multiple children, circle, rectangle, um, square, you get, you get the point. If I want to have an array shaped, I, I can only have an array of circle or an array of rectangle and an array of square. Or everything in an array should have, must have the same type. So if I want to have an array with three of these objects, I have no choice but to treat them as shapes, because now they are the same type. So you will often write code like this, uh, base, um, pointer array, equals new base, uh, let's say 10. Actually, it should be two array, this might be too complicated. Uh, and then you say base number one, is new is new derived. Or actually I'm gonna use this example. You have an array of shapes. So you have ten shapes, right? And then you say but shape number one is zero. So the shape is alright. The first item in the shape is a circle. The second is a square and so on. So it is very, it is absolutely necessary to have this um, possibility to represent objects as a base class instead of as this class. Any other question? So the point of um, the um, the point about virtual is extremely important. We need to understand that before we can move on. No other question? Okay, again, polymorphism is many, many forms. Uh, Alright, so in here, I have a square which is a shape. I can I can declare um, a pointer of type shape to a circle. I can make an alias of type shape to a circle, and so on. Is it confusing? Now I, I find it helpful to sort of um, write these notions, um, these these symbols, in a particular way. So this symbol actually has two meanings. This symbol has two meanings as well. And you read them differently. Um, so when you have a type of a, of a pointer like this, shape, um, I find it useful to write the, M, uh, the asterisk like this, right, right next to the name of the type, and then a space, and then the name of uh, the pointer, instead of, instead of that. And then this will read as, P is a pointer of type shape. 
However, um, when you call, when you use P after declaring it like this, then this is not a pointer anymore. This is an object. P is an object. Yeah, P is not a pointer anymore. The same, the, the, the same to uh, to the ampersand. When you declare, when, when you write like this. It is a little bit more difficult to interpret than writing it like this with a space. When it is like this, you, you read R is a alias <coughs> type shape to an object. Right? But when you use R down in the code, you write this. And this is no longer an object, this is a pointer. So because it is a pointer, you can do things like this. And because um, asterisk p is an object, you can do things like this. But yeah, be careful with how you write that ampersand and asterisk. When you when you use uh, when you declare it, try to put this asterisk and ampersand next to the name of the type. When you use the variable, put it next to the name of the variable. <coughs> that will be a little bit more useful. And less confusing to look at, but um, this says we have a we declare we cre we create a circle and we create a square and then we will we will sort of um, create another pointer that points to the same address. Right, so this is the address now. It's no longer alias. Pointer P points to the address of C. So different pointers, but same object. So I can call C, in which case it will be considered a circle, or I can use P, in which case still the same object, but it will be considered a, a, a shape. And same here. So when you um, when you create something as a derived class object, but you reference it using a base class pointer, then your compiler will always treat it foremost as the base class. And if you have a virtual keyword anywhere in the code, then it will also try to search for more. It can do that because we know for sure that if you have a base class and you have a derived class, you can declare as many more functions or variables in the uh, derived class. Um, but the original functions and original variables in the base class will still will always be there. They cannot go away. So it is safe to treat a circle as a shape because you know that the point of origin is always there. But it's not safe to treat a, sh a, a, a shape as a circle because you don't know if the radius is there, right? So um, if you do something crazy like this, circle C equals new shape, right? the compiler will reject this line of code. So this um, sort of demonstrates the importance of having the, the virtual keyword. When you don't have a virtual keyword and you treat uh, so P is a pointer to C, C is a, is a circle. When you treat circle as a circle, it will print out all the information of a circle. When you treat it as a pointer of a shape, when you treat it as a shape, and you call it here, it, would, it will only print the information um, of the shape, not of the circle. And we learned how to avert this problem by having the virtual keyword. Yeah, virtual. And you declare virtual when it is in a place where it's, it is first searched for. 
So if you use circle as a shape, then the compiler will search this line first. If it sees the keyword virtual, it will sort of say, okay, hang on, I'll search more. So if you declare this not with, uh, without the keyword virtual and you declare virtual here, it has no effect at all. Because if you don't have the virtual keyword there, the compiler will stop as soon as it finds the print function in shape. Right, so now with the key with the virtual keyword, we, we, we get this. Even though it is treated as a as a shape, um, it is still still prints out all, all the information of the circle. Again, is there any any question? Understand? Understood? Yeah. Alright, um, so this is a bit of a tricky question. Um, so previously we know how to refer to an existing object using the base, um, the base type. If you have a circle, right, somewhere, you can refer to it as a shape like this. So this is an, an existing object, right? and this is a pointer, that's fine. But what happens if you forgot to use these uh, symbols? Right? This is not, no longer um, a pointer, it is a new object, P is now a new object. And what does it mean when you say object P is C? And what happens when you call print function from the newly constructed object. So what happens is, I think we will learn sometime next, after the break, is that there are different types of constructor. There is a, a special constructor called a copy constructor. When you do this, because this is a new object, it needs to be constructed. And this says construct this new object using all the information here. So the copy constructor will sort of um, go into the scope of C and see what variables are there. And if there are variables that have the same name, same type in P, the val values of those variables will be copied from C to P. So you will end up with P having um, the same information as C does. But it doesn't have all the information, all the extra information C does. The shape only has mx and my. C has mx and my and radius. So only the mx and my will be copied to P. Radius will not be. So when you call this, obviously this is a shape. Um, it is it is truly a shape, it's not a circle. It will print down only the first two, two numbers. These two numbers are copied by this line, and then they are printed out by the print function that belongs to the shape class. Right. Um, any any question here? I probably will learn about uh, copy constructor later. But you get the idea. So if you want to refer to something that already exists, don't forget to use all of these symbols. That's quite important. Or something like this, you see. But this is important. Yeah. So this is the proper way to refer to a derived a derived object as a base class. Right now, it comes to something that is even more important than everything I said was important. Um, the um, order in which you call the destructor is that you will call the destructor of the object. Um, if, if, you have, if you have a circle, see, um, and you call delete, Delete C. 
then the order in which the these structures are invoked will be first we will call C. So we will call the structure C on circle. And then because C is a drive class of check, we will also call the D structure check. Now, the reason why it calls this bus is not because C is an object of time circle. It is because it is a pointer of time circle. And so be very aware of this. An object has a concrete So any function that you call from a pointer of type x will first be searched in the namespace of x. Right. So the, the, the reason why circle, the destructure of circle is called here first was because it is represented as a circle. So it will search in this namespace. Now let's say we have a circle, but we refer to it as a shape. And you call delete C. The destructor of C will not be called. Will not be called. Because the compiler sees that this is a shape, there's no reason to you know, destruct something other than a shape. Make sense? So it will search for a destructor in the scope of the type point, not the type of the object. So C is a circle, it does have its own destructor, but because it is represented as a shape, the, the, the compiler will search for the destructor in the shape of a namespace. And if you declare something here that you need to clean up, it will not be cleaned up. So we need to somehow force the compiler or force a computer really to call the destructor of the object instead of, of the of the point. And how do we do that? We do the same thing that we did with the print function. That's to we de we declare the destructor virtual. Right, so let me de demonstrate that here. Yeah. So in here I have class A and class B. So class A has a array dynamically allocated by the constructor. Yeah? And when it is uh, destructed, it will be reclaimed. The resource will be reclaimed. So everything is fine here. Same to class B. It has its own resources. Now because B is a derived class of A, it will also have <coughs> A resources as well. But this is the is this everything that it has access to. So in the constructor B, it will allocate memory for B resources. And in the destructor B, it will reclaim B resources. So we can construct a B. If, if we just have a B, see what happens. So because B is a dry class of A, the constructor of A will be called first right, to allocate memory for A resources, and then the constructor of B will be called after that to allocate memory for B resources. And then we B goes out of scope, the destructor of B will be called first to release this um, resources, B resources, and then A will release A resources. Everything is fine then. However, if you refer to B as an A, B equals new B. So in the memory, we still have a B. We don't have an A, we have a B. But let's see what happens. 